Hello there, welcome back to the channel. In this video, I thought I'd talk a little bit about a piece of music that I created for a game trailer. The game is called Astronomo, and we're working towards an early access release on Steam. And it's a little sort of construction game where you make little vehicles and contraptions and have to solve these physics-based puzzles on these alien worlds. Um, and you're playing these little sort of space explorer types um, and sort of basically trying to get home. And so all of the music kind of follows the slightly DIY, homemade, little bit kind of controlled chaos kind of feel um, that comes from the nature of the gameplay. And yeah, I um, was quite happy with how this little piece of music turned out for the trailer that we released um, a couple of months back. So I just thought I'd do a bit of a deep dive into the track. Um, and just talk about it from the angle of a couple of different arranging concepts, which I think hopefully um, I can use the track to explain what those concepts are, and then you'll have some takeaways that hopefully you can apply to your own compositions. So without further ado, here's the trailer. So as you can hear, there's sort of a nod to that kind of epic grand scale orchestral sound world, um, slightly tongue in cheek, mixed with some quirkier elements, a lot of percussion, some sort of mouth trumpet noises, um, bike bells, little bits of uh, little, little kind of bits and pieces, I guess, that um, give it a slightly more playful feel. I was definitely also quite influenced by the Chicken Run soundtrack, which is one of my kind of go to uh, happy place kind of pieces of music, particularly the main theme and Building the Crate um, by John Powell and Harry Gregson Williams. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is the melody from an arranging perspective. In this case I actually already had a melody because I knew that I wanted to use the main theme of the game, but I did need to decide exactly how I wanted to present that melody in terms of orchestration. At the opening, we have a little fanfare thing, the melody starts off with sort of trumpet or mouth trumpet. Then it moves to a whistle in the next phrase. Then it changes again after that little break. Um, so the, the kind of the pieces are split up into three main sections, I guess, plus an intro. Um, in the third section, we get a tuba. And then it's kind of joined by other instruments, trumpet and uh, choir at the end. With the tubas still going throughout all of that. And the point that I wanted to make is that I made sure to keep the melody in a single instrument or group of instruments um, for a decent length of time before moving on to another instrument. This is not something I've always been particularly good at. In the past, when I was starting out arranging and writing, um, I well, a lot of my compositions, they sort of suffered a bit from this like slightly distracted feeling where the arrangement and the orchestration would constantly move around and kind of be quite glittery in that way, quite sort of flighty and colorful, but would lack a sense of intentionality and might feel a bit kind of restless. Um, and part of the reason was because I would often break up melodies into smaller fragments and orchestrate those out to different instruments. Um, whereas as I've gained more experience, I've found that um, it's quite effective to just allow each orchestration to sit for a little bit longer and just to settle in, to bed in, and to allow the listener a chance to kind of latch onto it. Partly because um, I think... I don't want to overwhelm the listener with too much information in too short a space of time. And so it's a way of slightly simplifying things by uh, by saying, this is the melody instrument, okay, you've got that. And then when it feels like it's had enough time to kind of do its thing, then I might switch it up and create a bit of variety that way. Next, I want to talk about a particular way of doing counter melodies or sort of backing parts in an arrangement like this. Um, and that's 
a sort of supportive counter melody, one which, um, a bit like backing vocals often do in pop music, um, they support the main melody, they don't create a lot of new material. So let's just listen to the opening of this again, and particularly have a listen to what the horn and strings are doing in the background. So there's that kind of downward motion, du, 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 and there's some string pads going. If I just play some of that in isolation so you can hear. So some kind of paddy stuff that is basically the same kind of shape as the main melody, du, 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 except it's kind of simplified and it's kind of filling out the harmony a bit. Um, that's what I mean by supporting counter melody. It's not doing anything that contradicts the main flow. Have a listen to the trombones at the very end of this as well, and they're doing a kind of similar idea. Here. They're a bit buried in the mix, so let me just play them in isolation. And with everything else. So once again, the idea is having something that sits behind the main melody in a supportive way, has a similar contour. And crucially, these are usually quite singable lines um, that feel like simplified versions of the melody and they don't catch the ear too much. Um, and they often have a similar dynamic shape. You know, they get louder and softer in a similar way to the lead part. Um, but they're not playing the same notes as the lead part. So they're often uh, underpinning the harmony as well um, and just thickening the overall sound in that manner. By contrast, we have another way of approaching counter melodies and backing parts. That is to offer something that's quite complementary and quite different to what the main melody is doing. Um, and potentially does risk actually distracting the listener a little more. So it has to be used with caution, this technique. Um, but let me just play you a little section here that I think demonstrates this nicely. So listen to the kind of quick strings that are happening in this passage. So I don't know if you caught that, um, I'll just play them in isolation so you can hear a bit better. So that little idea, that kind of quick string riff, that's happening at the same time as the melody, um, is offering a very different kind of character in the arrangement. You know, it's not kind of mimicking the mood of the main melody, it's just bringing in something very fresh. Um, but something that is in keeping with the overall spirit of the piece, um, to me anyway, in this case, um, it's sort of bringing a bit of a, like a kind of fast country sort of feel, almost like a bluegrassy kind of feel. Another example would be this bit just immediately following it. Um, listen in particular to the banjo. You got this dun dun ga dun 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 da dun 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 which kind of interrupts just the general kind of mm cha mm cha mm cha it's like a a kind of quite a definitive musical statement that again isn't necessarily being derived from what's come before it. One always has to be quite careful about not overloading the arrangement and uh, you know I've got two ideas you know sometimes three kind of going on at once but that's probably the limit um, in 90% of situations I find. One thing about this arrangement is I very deliberately waited until the initial phrase of the melody had been completed in a bit more of a simple form before developing and adding these back background, more kind of exciting background things in the second phrase of the melody, which is um, in large part a repeat of the first phrase. So they're not just being hit with everything all at once, if that makes sense. The next arranging concept that I'd like to talk about is quite simple. It's just the idea of having fills or filler material um, and just being aware of any natural gaps in the melody and sort of targeting those in some sense with um, what you're writing for the other more supporting instruments. Uh, so an example of this would be uh, the little string fill that happens around here. That little -la 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 -la. 
this thing here. You actually only really hear it at bar 13, but it's already kind of started um, in bar 12. Often when I'm writing that sort of thing, I'll hear the gap and the opportunity for something there and I'll hear a little idea in my head. And then I'll think, okay, how can I sort of lead up to that and create some material that precedes it, that feels like it naturally just then happens to arrive at this little bit of daylight in the arrangement, um, this little kind of gap that opens up. The choir in this part. So, you know, the melody goes bum, 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 and there's kind of a natural break there, and so I sort of then use the choir to just fill that in. A very common example of this concept is, of course, just drum fills or percussion fills. You know, it's as relevant in this kind of scoring music as it is in a rock pop context. So we have a really simple one here at um, bar 10. Just a simple digga digga. We've got another one at bar six. Whereas previously our rhythm has just been dun 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 dun. Now we have this triplet du 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 coming in, which kind of almost puts on the brakes a little bit and just draws attention to itself because it's quite different to anything that's gone before it. Du du du. You know, just that, that three-hit snare thing there. So some of these kinds of decisions just sort of happen quite intuitively. I'll just hear something, and then it's only later that I'll realise, oh, the reason that works is because it's filling in gaps in the melody or whatever. Um, other times it might be slightly more analytical. I'll be thinking, okay, how can I inject a bit more movement, a bit more interest, a bit more density in this part of the arrangement? And so I'll be kind of a bit more consciously thinking about where there are gaps or natural breaks in the melody where I can have things poke through. This arranging concept I'd like to talk about I'm referring to as rhythmic riffing, meaning a part where the primary thing that it's contributing is rhythm, whether it's a melodic instrument or a harmonic instrument or actual percussion. Uh, it's this idea of having little loops or cells of material um, of a particular rhythm that just generates, it's like a little engine, it just generates a little bit of interest and excitement. Um, so, you know, obviously this is happening a lot just in the nature of looping percussion parts. If we just have a quick listen to some of the percussion here. So there's like this dum daga daga da, dum daga daga da idea. That's primarily what's being said, that's what's being spoken there. Here in the mandolin, we've got a sort of strumming pattern thing. Which actually is quite similar, it's kind of, you know, it's all locking together here. Um, and then in the banjo later on, we've got this. They don't really have melody lines as such. They're more just like riffs, little kind of rhythmic or accent patterns um, that are just sort of bubbling away there. Another example would be the high strings in this later section. It's just this kind of one little loop, this little pattern. So yeah, I guess on reflection, a lot of these, they can be just continuous streams of notes, but they create an interesting accent pattern, or it's just, you know, an interesting shape that repeats and loops and loops. But the point is, it's not really like a linear melody. It's more just a little kind of looping shape. That's the general idea. So the next arranging technique I'd like to discuss is called reinforcement. At least that's what I like to call it. Um... It's just this idea of having two or more parts that are working together essentially to, to speak one idea, a bit like we saw with the percussion and the uh, mandolin part earlier. So here at the beginning we have the tuba and the bass. So functionally, it's kind of one thing, it's one piece of the arrangement. They're sort of working together towards a single goal. Here's another example, we've got this happening in the sort of vocals. And then joined by the brass. So the brass are doing something a little bit more uh, complicated 
and the the sort of warbly vocal part is doing essentially a simplified version of that, but that's just reinforcing the brass melody. Um, and the two kind of work together to create something that um, still feels like one instrument or one part. I think the reason I really like this sound, particularly in this kind of context, is it sort of allows each instrument to do its own thing um, while still participating in a kind of unison with other instruments. It's a bit like in early jazz, like Dixieland jazz and trad jazz, where you have lots of different melody instruments all kind of giving their take on the melody, but it has this sort of slight fuzzy edge to it as different instruments kind of add their own little details. Um, so yeah, to me that has a particular kind of emotional resonance. In the case of a game like this where, you know, the actual content of the game is all about working together with your buddies, um, you know, these you have your own avatar, you have your own kind of um, different things that you're doing to try and come together as a team, you know, it, it feels quite fitting to all of that to utilise this kind of musical technique. And finally, the last point that I wanted to make um, regarding arranging and arranging concepts is simply the notion of having breaks, uh, natural breaks in the music. So in this piece, you know, it's only a 30 second piece. So, you know, sometimes with something as short as 30 seconds, you can just kind of roll on through. But I thought it was quite nice to just have a little bit of a breath here at around bar 10. So let's just kind of listen out for that. <laughs> So there's, there's nothing going on in the arrangement just except for that little digger digger on the snare drum. Um, so I personally, I like that in, for a number of reasons. It feels quite cute. It feels like a nice little moment to kind of, you know, just bring everything back down to this little snare drum. I just find that for some reason a little bit endearing. But also it's kind of, I think the thing about the whole orchestra sort of taking a breath at that point is that it, it sort of makes it feel like it's just one organism. So much of what I'm trying to do when I'm creating arrangements is give the sense that there's a unity of purpose and that there's just this kind of one, this one thing, this one sort of living, breathing thing that's rolling along um, that has a particular personality. And so, yeah, m having moments in the arrangement where sort of everything comes to a stop or everything kind of gestures in a similar direction um, is just a really cool thing to do. It's a really cool effect. It kind of is like, it, you know, especially in arrangements like this where there's lots of different musical personalities. It's an opportunity for that sense of unity to really kind of come to the foreground for a moment. So that's it. Seven arranging concepts derived from this piece of music that I wrote for this game trailer for Astronomo that's currently in development. Um, keep an eye out for the uh, early access release of the game on Steam. I'll put links in the description and you can check out the CoatSync YouTube channel for various development blogs. I'll probably be doing one at some point just talking a bit about the music that's uh, currently work in progress. Um, thanks very much for watching. I hope you had something that you could take away and apply to your own compositions. And um, yeah, let me know any questions that you have and hopefully see you on the next video. Thanks very much for your attention.